of America, presented by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. The Cavalcade of America presents Carl Swenson in the story of Joel Chandler Harris, an original radio play written by Arthur Miller. Joel Chandler Harris, recognized throughout the world as one of our nation's great writers of folklore, whose tales of Uncle Remus have endeared him to millions. Supporting Carl Swenson in the role of Joel Chandler Harris are the Cavalcade players. Our orchestra and the original musical score are under the direction of Don Voorhees. DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Carl Swenson as Joel Chandler Harris on the Cavalcade of America. <laughs> made him out of tar and turkum time. And then he took this here tar baby and he sat her on the big road. He put her on the road, Uncle Terrell? Yeah. And then, you see, he snuck off in the bushes and he wait. But not long, cause by and by, here come Brer Rabbit, pacing down the road, lippity-clippity-clippity-lippity. And he spied the tar baby, didn't he? Yeah. And, and, and he fought up on his behind legs like he was astonished. Morning, says he to the tar baby. Nice weather this morning, says he. And the fox still hiding, huh? Yes, sir, right in the bushes. Well, Tar Baby ain't saying nothing. So Brother Rabbit, he say, Is you deep? Cause if you is, I can holler louder, says he. Tar Baby stay still. And Brother Fox, he lay low. You, you is stuck up, that's what you is, says Brother Rabbit. I'm going to learn you how to talk to speckable folks if it's the last act, says he. And blip, Brother Rabbit took her side of the head. And his fist stuck, can't pull loose. Not his own Uncle Tell? Uh-uh. And Brother Fox, he lay low. Then Brother Rabbit, he fetched the tar baby a wipe with the other hand. And that stuck. <laughs> yeah, two hands stuck. And then he butted, and his head got stuck. Oh, Brother Fox got him now. He got oh, him. Wait, 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 wait up now. Brother Fox, he sauntered forth looking just as innocent as one of your mockingbirds. Howdy, Brother Rabbit, said Brother Fox. Uh, you are looking sort of stuck up this morning. <laughs> and then he rolled on the ground and laughed till he couldn't laugh no more. Then he ate up real rapid, didn't he? Well, uh, uh, that depends, Joe. Now, some folks say that Brother Fox laughed himself so sick he just couldn't think about eating nothing. <laughs> That boy listening was Joel Chandler Harris. In the shadow of that old slave's cabin, he spent his childhood listening to the strange adventures of Br'er Rabbit. And when he grew older, Joe took a job on the plantation helping Mr. Turner, the owner, who published a country newspaper on the premises. But always he was drawn back to Uncle Terrell, and together they'd pass the afternoons talking or following the trails in the woods nearby. Oh, look what you did now, Terrell. Hmm? You scared him off. Oh, that don't look like no bar cub to me. L look to me like a plain little old pussycat. Shh. Listen to that. What that? Those birds. Oh, them fences. They all is talking. Talking? Huh? Yeah, well, don't laugh now. When the sun come out nice and warm, fences, they're, they're talking as birds. Terrell? Hmm? You know what you never told me? What that I ain't never tell you? Did you make up all the stories uh, about Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Fox and the rest? Who, me? Lord, no. Them stories is before my daddy and, and before most folks was even born. Well, who made them up then? Well, how do I know? Uh, uh, I know the fellow wants to say that Br'er Rabbit come over on the slaver ships uh, from Africa, he said. But uh, I wasn't there, so I ain't vouching for the liability of the count. Whoa! Joey! Oh, I better get back to the house. I'm coming! See you later, Uncle. Yeah, you, you, you come on around to the cabin and we see what we can find out about what them birds is talking about. <laughs> I'll be there. See you over. <laughs> Bye. Joe's a 
man went so far as to write you a letter all the way from Macon. He must be convinced you're good enough to hold the job. Yeah, but that's a, a big city newspaper. You've got to be a real newspaper man. Now, to... look here. You've got plenty of experience, and I'll wager there ain't many, many down there has read the books you have. Well, it, it ain't that, Mr. Turner. I, 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 they're going to laugh at me. Well, I hope you know what to think of a man who'd laugh at a boy because he's a little thin and has got red hair. No, I'm, I mean my stutter. I can't talk well. I'd better stay here. Now, staying here ain't good. You only get you no place. Time's changing, Joe. It's the big cities where a man can make something of himself. You've got too much in you to be hiding that out here. There's just one thing I want to tell you, though. They're saying now that if a man's got money, there ain't nothing else he needs. I just hope that if I didn't teach you anything else, you'll learn to be yourself, just what you are, and what nobody will pay you to become. I guess there's a, a lot of things I never thanked you for, Mr. Turner. Now go on, I... pack your trunk. Get well, along. I... Now stop thinking that a man only is as good as he looks in the mirror. It ain't so, Harris. I don't guess it ever was. Why, Joe Harris. Are you staying alone in the house again? Oh, I'm all right, Miss Stark. Just let me be. Well, now. what's the matter with you? Everybody in Macon's at the dance. Well, I... I just feel like sitting here, that's all. I pay my rent, don't I? Oh, I don't understand it. Your name known all over the South, a famous newspaper man, and what you do but sit shut up by yourself. Yeah, like... I, I guess it sounds all simple and stupid. But maybe you can tell me how being famous helps any when you got red hair and when you talk like a cricket and you look like a fence post. Did Essie turn you down, Joe? No. She didn't get a chance to because I didn't ask her. Oh, you said you were going to. You've been saying that for three years, in fact. Well, I, I, I couldn't. I, I just couldn't get myself up to do it. Well, then why not go over now? Right now. Well, she's gone back to Canada. She left this afternoon. Oh, Joe, you poor... No, I ain't a poor nothing. I'm a fool. That's what I am. Essie loves me. I know. I mean, I bet she does. Everybody knows she does. Well, sure. Here I've been sitting around for three years, eating out my heart for her and, and living right next door. Now... Who ever heard of such a thing? That's the way to talk. You go to Canada. Sure, I'll write her a letter. Oh, Joe, that's no way to propose. Why, you... No, wanna... no, 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 no. I couldn't... Couldn't ask her straight up to her face. I... I just can't do that. I know the trouble with you. You never practiced how to meet people. It, it's something you've got to learn, just like writing or No, I, a... I... I... I just wasn't meant to be seen. That's all there is to it. Joe... Let me teach you. Oh. Well, that's, that's visitors for you. I'd better go upstairs. Here's your chance. They're two lovely young ladies. Let me out. I... Uh, Joe, people want to no. see you. They're all talking about uh, you. Uh, let me through that door, Mrs. You can't Stark. get out without passing the front door now, and I'm going to open no, it. No, let me go upstairs, No, please. you're going to meet these girls. No. Joe, come away from that window. Joe! Oh, Lord, he's going to jump clear down to the wall. <laughs> Ever since you come back from Canada, I've I wanted to bring you out to the park here. Yeah. You like it? It's very nice, Joe. Uh, yeah. Now, I never thought there'd be so many birds in Savannah. There's probably even more than you've seen. Yeah, and, and uh, the, the grass. Uh, isn't the grass? Uh... Uh-huh. Yes, Joe. Yeah. Oh, then, then you, you, you know, Essie... Know what, Joe? Well, what I'm I'm trying to... You know what I did my first day here in Savannah? I ran for a trolley car. Everybody turned around to see a man running in, in Savannah. Especially for a trolley, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Essie. Yes, Joe? Now, I'm, I'm making $40 a week. 
That's a lot of money, isn't it? Well, it's it's just about twice what I need, see? Uh, that, that is p- for myself, alone. Well, we'll just have to figure out how you can spend more. Oh, I see. I, I know I look like a fence post. Oh, Joe. And and you're so pretty, I could cry tears. Joe, in the park. Look, I, I just feel that I can say it now, Essie. Please let me. I don't I, have the slightest idea what Essie, you... Essie, I love you. Uh, I'm glad, Joe. Uh, well, eh, uh, you don't mean that you kind of like me, Essie. Kind of? Uh, Essie. Now, I, I know I ain't much, but my stuff is being reprinted all over the country now, and a lot of people think I'm going to turn into a, a kind of a writer someday. And I, I w- was sort of thinking that it, it wasn't too selfish of me to ask you to marry me. All right, Joe. Essie. Joe, we're in the park. Essie, I did it. I did it. I, I just want to ask you one question, Joe. And I want the answer from your heart. Essie, you know I couldn't lie. Then tell me, why do you love me? Why? You ought to be able to answer that, Joe. Well, principally because I can't help it. don't care how good he is. If a man can't tend to his job, he's got no place on the Atlanta Constitution. Well, maybe you're right. I just said that yeah. I... Oh, here he is. Uh, sit down, Harris. Oh, thank you. Harris, I... is the third day hand running that Sam Small ain't showed up here to write his Uncle Si column. Everybody and his mother is writing and asking, where is Uncle Si? We've just got to have an Uncle Si column for tomorrow's paper. Oh, well, I, I could go look for Sam. He's usually over no, at the... No, Joe, no. I want you to write it. Me? Oh, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm only a newspaper man. Sam Small is a writer. You're a writer, Joe. Unless I'm a bigger fool than I think I am, there ain't a better writer in the South today. Well, that's not the point. See, I'm all right at a, a short paragraph and a, uh, editorial page jokes, but this, you know, this, this, uh, needs a story maker, an artist. Well, it, why can't you write stories, Joe? I, well, I, I, uh, it, 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 it's like asking an ant to fly. Now, it's too bad I don't agree with you, Joe. Now, just sit down. You can have my office. Now, Captain Howell, it just ain't... Joe Harris, take I your can... head in your two hands and knock me out a story for tomorrow's paper. No, now, just a now, minute. good I luck, can't... Joe, and make it good. Yeah, but I... What do you think I am? Pull a story out of the air just like... I can't write it. Maybe something about the plantation or... Uh... Uh, maybe, maybe Brother Rabbit. Then Brother Fox lay off in the bushes, and he wait, but not long, because by and by, here come Brother Rabbit, pacing down the road. Once, clippity, 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 there was an old man, and his name was Uncle, his leg, Uncle Remus, and he liked to sit with a little boy, eating hoe cakes around an old Dutch stove. What's the matter with you, Joe? Joe? Why don't you smile? Now, look at this mail you're getting. Oh, it's it's wonderful. I I think it's just wonderful. Look at him, will you? Whole country going crazy about Uncle Remus, and the office stands there like an undertaker. What's wrong, Joe? Why don't you read the mail? Yeah. Well, I looked at a lot of the letters. I'm I'm just so grateful. I I don't quite know what to say. Grateful. Mm -hmm. Man, you ought to be proud. Look at these sacks of mail, and all for you. Well... No, Captain Howell, I kind of think these letters are for Uncle Remus and Br'er Rabbit. Uncle Remus, hundreds of people have heard stories about Br'er Rabbit, but it took a writer, yes, sir, and a great writer to put him down. Oh, I, I, I don't get the feeling I'm writing stories when I write Uncle Remus. I, I feel like I'm saying what millions have said in the darkness of night around open fires, you know, or, or, or in, in the noonday rest in the fields, or... In the orchards of a thousand farms. 
It's like my hand is kind of helping America to remember a time in her history that's passing away now. When the world had room enough on the old colored man, the little boy, to set half the clock around talking and listening while the red fox sniffed behind the old smokehouse on a summer afternoon. See, that's what I want folks to find in these stories, Captain Howe. Kindliness and comradeship. That's Uncle Remus. <laughs> Mamie, we've got to clean house before Mr. Harris gets home. Better come here and help me get this furniture out into the hall. Mr. Harris ain't going to like moving the furniture. Dad man's terrible again spring cleaning. Well, hurry and let's get it out before it comes back from the post office. Now, easy, watch that corner. Gotcha. Oh, Joe. Joe, you scared me near to death. You put that table down, Essie. Oh. You snuck up behind my back, but sure as I'm alive, there ain't going to be no spring cleaning again this year. But, Joe, the house has got to be clean. Essie, I don't see nothing dirty in this house. Because you don't look. Well, if, if you stop looking, then we'd both be happy. Oh. Essie, you know, I can't stand it. It, it, it. it just makes me feel... Like you're turning me upside down and shaking me out. Oh, Joe, I don't know what I'm going to do with you. Well, you just sit down and let's look over my mail. <laughs> Maybe you can go and see how the roast is coming. And, and don't move nothing. <laughs> it's a nice warm day and fine for just taking it easy. Yes, sir, Mr. Harris. Essie, got a little surprise for you. There's a letter here from Mark Twain. No. Let me open it. No, 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 no. Now we're going to leave that one for last. Now, uh, here's one I started to read. It's from London. Yeah. Professor from Cambridge University. Says, uh, dear Mr. Harris, uh, 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 we have uh, discovered that your identical Br'er Rabbit stories are told by natives in India, Burma, the Amazon country, the Congo. Well, well, what do you know about that, Essie? Brer Rabbit sure done a mighty traveling, huh? Isn't it remarkable? The same stories. Well, it ain't so remarkable at that, you know. I guess when people get to feeling low, it's just as natural to make believe they're a rabbit always escaping from the fox in India and Burma as it is anywhere else. What's this from the publisher? Oh, yeah, he says the Hungarian edition of Uncle Remus is off the press. Hungarian? Yeah. That's 27 languages Remus is yeah. in. Oh, Joe. Yeah. I almost feel like a somebody, Essie. You are, Joe. You're a famous writer all over the world. Oh, well, not really. Look what Mr. Riley said about you. Oh, foot. James Whitcomb Riley thinks I'm a great writer mainly because I don't press my clothes either. Come on, Joe, let's see what Mark Twain said. You're all right now. Now, hold your breath. Let's see. Uh, uh, I guess I'm not the only one who thinks your work is worthy to live. I can tell you confidentially that within the next day or so, you'll be getting an invitation to visit Teddy Roosevelt at the White House. Joe! Now, wait. Now, look what else. I'll be there myself. So it'll be a fine chance to meet and talk things over. Joe, you're going. Yeah. Oh, I can see in your face you don't want to go. Well, now, look. Look, I, nothing. I, All your life you shied away from coming out and showing yourself. Why, you're famous, Joe. You're an important man. Yes, <laughs> you're crying. Well, I want you to take your honors, Joe. So many do that don't deserve them. Well, I got my honors, Essie. Uncle Remus is making kids laugh all over the world. That's enough for one man. And anyway, I, I don't feel at home with famous men, literary men. A ain't it good enough knowing that they invited me? Joe, if you don't go, I'm never going to speak to you. Oh, now, Essie, don't talk. And I'm starting spring cleaning this minute. No, Essie, it, it, it takes ten years off my life. Maybe? I, no, all right, all right, I'm going to Washington. And, and if you ain't finished tearing the house apart when I get back, I'll burn it down over the both of us. <laughs> Heaven help the country, Mr. Train, when the president forgets how to laugh. 
Yeah, and heaven help the president when the country forgets how to laugh. <laughs> uh, Mr. Harris, we've been beating around the bush all evening. So I think it's time I got to the point. I want you to do me a favor. Oh, well, you know, any time I can help out the president, and I got the time to spare, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to tell me a Br'er Rabbit story. Oh, no. I mean just the way they ought to be told. You know, when you read them, it's not the same as hearing them spoken. With all the richness of the dialect. Come on, Harris, tell me the one, say, uh, about how Bear Rabbit milked the cow. Well, go ahead, Joe. First thing you know, you'll be raising your taxes. <laughs> what in the world is that? To the end of the window, Mr. Harris. Huh? My, my, the whole lawn is covered with children. Yes, they're calling for you, Mr. Harris. Oh, I can't go out there. But you've got to say hello to them. Go on, Harris. You're the best friend some of them ever had. You're like a god to them. They've been brought up with Br'er Rabbit in their cradle. Yeah, but see, they'll they'll be disappointed, no. They, they, they'll be uh, expecting to see some kind of a, a great man or something. Oh, nonsense. They know you just as I know you. Not having seen a man's face and his hair, heard his voice doesn't mean you can't know him. Go on, go on, you're old friends. Take him to the door, Mr. Twain. Oh, so why didn't anybody tell him I was here? Say something, Joe. They're waiting. Uh, uh. Howdy, children. Would don't nobody say howdy to me? Why, he's white. You ain't Uncle Remus. Where's Uncle Remus? All right, children. All right, all right. <laughs> Show can't flip nothing over on you, can I? Well, Uncle Remus is down in Georgia, just where he always was. And I'll be sure to tell him that you asked after him, and I'm sure that he sends you his most kindly regards. I'm sorry, Joe. Ain't that funny? I, I wasn't nothing to him. Oh, that's not true, Mr. Harris. Yeah, yeah, it is, Mr. President. I, I might... Just as well been a, a streetcar conductor coming out the hair. It's Uncle Remus they know, and it's Uncle Remus they, they love. Why are you smiling, Mr. Harris? Well, Mr. President, I just realized that I finally got what I wanted. You know, in, in all my work, from beginning to end, I've been saying one thing. America has got to remember her roots, the plain people. She must never forget good neighborliness. Because this is more than a country, you know. It is the hope and the vision of all the people in the world. And I tried to say that in the heart of my story. And it looks now like the people have understood so well and, and made it so much their own that Joel Chandler Harris has been dropped like a husk. You mustn't feel that way, Joe. No, no, I, I, I see now that's what I wanted. See, it, I, I listened to the people... And I told them what I heard. And then they given me back enough. There's, there's only one thing that, that I seem to see before me now. The smiling faces of thousands of children. Some young and fresh, and some wearing the friendly marks of age. And I seem to hear a voice above all the rest saying, You made some of us happy, Joe Harris. You've written Uncle Remus into history, Mr. Harris. Yeah, yeah. I guess I kind of wrote myself out of it. Our thanks to Carl Swenson and the Cavalcade players for their performance of the story of Joel Chandler Harris, whose gentle stories of Uncle Remus have enriched the folk literature of our people. While to millions of readers all over the world, the popularity of this American author is exceeded only by the Bible, Shakespeare, and Pilgrim's Progress. And now DuPont brings you news of chemistry at work in our world. In your home, you have at least one bristle brush. Maybe a toothbrush, it may be a hairbrush. And if it's a new one with nylon bristles, you'll agree it's a better brush. 
something like 90% of the toothbrushes manufactured in the United States during 1941, retailing at 20 cents or more, will be bristled with nylon filament. And bristles of nylon filament went into more than half of the white hairbrushes bought last year. But do you have any idea of how much industry depends on brushes? Fifty million brushes a year are used in washing bottles alone. Just as nylon yarn revolutionized stockings, nylon bristles have revolutionized brushes. In electroplating, for example, silver and cadmium solutions eat away natural bristles in a short time. But nylon bristles are practically untouched by any normal plating solution. Vacuum cleaner brushes with nylon bristles whirling around 3,000 times a minute, rubbing against heavy fabrics and gritty particles of dirt, outlast horsehair brushes four times. The textile industry makes use of shuttle brushes, tenter brushes, and any number of other kinds. In printing a fabric, a brush called a furnisher carries the dye to the engraved metal rolls. Tampico fiber from Mexican cactus used to be best for furnisher brushes, and even so, the printing rollers sometimes wore them out in a week. A nylon furnisher brush has been on duty for more than a year now in one textile plant, and it's still working. The cleaning and dyeing industry related to textiles uses still more brushes. Whole batteries of them operate in rug cleaning machines. And there are spotting brushes that must resist carbon tetrachloride, ether, alcohol, chloroform, ammonia, oxalic acid, hypochlorite of soda, a dozen strong cleaning solutions. Nylon brushes, because they stand up and don't fray out at the ends, give four times the service of old style brushes. Do you know how they wash milk bottles? Two big whirling brushes scrub the outside of the bottles as they move past, and smaller power brushes scrub them inside. Bringing the sparkle back to three billion milk bottles a year, these brushes used to wear out because they couldn't stand boiling water and the strong acid and alkali solutions that ensure sanitation. One large milk bottling plant reports nylon brushes in use for four months with no sign of wear. In fact, nylon bristles wear so long that in some cases today, Wooden brush handles and wooden cores go to pieces before the bristles do. The brushes have to be rebuilt with metal handles. Nylon bristles are serving industry today, saving time, energy, and money. They deserve honorable mention along with the other achievements of the chemist who brings us, in the words of the DuPont Pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. And now the star of next week's program, Edwin Jerome of the Cavalcade Players. I doubt if many of us know that the first time anybody ever flew in this country was during the 18th century. George Washington and Benjamin Franklin knew about it. In fact, they expressed themselves keenly about the future of American aviation as far back as 1796. This unusually astonishing story, Cavalcade brings you next week in a play about a man, Jean-Pierre Blanchard, and his balloon. We hope you'll join us a week from tonight for his story on the Cavalcade of America. On the Cavalcade of America, your announcer is Clayton Collier, sending best wishes from DuPont. This is the National Broadcasting Company.